I have the pleasure to introduce David Danks, um, Professor of Data Science and Philosophy at UCSD, and Nate Silver, FASB 2019 Business Fellow. And they're gonna um, guide our discussion tonight around the topic of Nazi crimes and the complicity of business leaders and professionals. I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bridget. Um, wow, uh, thank, thank you, Bridget, and thank, thank you all for staying. I'm still digesting um, that really powerful play. I um, feel really honored to have been here to see it. It was wonderful. So um, I think tonight we're gonna talk, I mean, I'm, I'm really gonna leave the, the core of the topic, at least initially, to, um, to David, Nazi crimes and the complicity of business leaders. Um, but I, I wanna just take a moment to share a bit about FASB, um, because I think that it's quite relevant to the discussion tonight. Um, and I think there's a lot in the play that will kind of uh, go nicely there and, and go nicely into, into the topic. So we, we heard this line um, in the play, and I, I wrote it down, and, and it says, in fact, the entire machinery of the Third Reich, none of it could have happened had the professional class of Germany not been behind it. And we saw in the play um, the role of doctors. I mean, that's really uh, discussed a lot, um, but there's lawyers you know, who, who wrote laws to make what was happening legal. There were journalists who were repurposed as propagandists. There were um, business leaders and engineers who built and operationalized and optimized so much of, of the machinery. Um, and at FASB, a number of us who were kind of leaving graduate school or, or in our careers and going into these professions, we spend time asking the question, why? Why did these professionals behave the way they did, do the things they did? Um, what can we learn from that behavior, those actions? How can we apply it to our lives and think about um, the ethics that we have to bring into our, uh, into our fields and our careers? And, and essentially, how can we create a more ethical um, world and, and you know more ethical professions. So I, I want to kind of ask you, David, um, as somebody who is a professor on this uh, program and who spends a lot of time thinking about these topics, um, we're here to talk about business. And there's another line in the play, you know, the, the Holocaust didn't happen in the passive voice. Um, so can you, can you maybe just speak to some of the ways that uh, business professionals were involved? Uh, sure. Um, so, the as mentioned earlier, FASB has a number of different programs, and this year launched the inaugural class of fellows focused in design and technology, um, and that's intimately related to what was occurring with uh, business leaders at the time. So, for example, in 1933, uh, many of you may know there was uh, the initial, the first really systematic survey by the German government of the uh, racial background of the people who lived in Germany at the time. Uh, that census was carried out using punch cards, uh, the things that later would be used for programmable computers, punch cards developed by international business machines, IBM. Um, now you might say, that, well, it's 1933. People didn't really know what was going on. Um, people knew what was going on. Uh, the camps were not yet created, but people knew where they were, it was fairly clear where things were headed. But more importantly, IBM was not a passive seller of these products. IBM worked hand in hand over the following years to optimize punch cards and to make them better able to conduct censuses. We know that a German subsidiary of IBM continued to be active in supporting the tracking and surveillance efforts, essentially, of the Nazis all the way through at least 1944. Uh, there are questions about exactly how much the New York office of IBM knew, um, but they certainly knew that they had a subsidiary that was 
complicit, at the very least, in the activities of the Nazi government. Um, there is a perhaps more, uh, even more troubling story, uh, which is the story of the company Topf and Sons. Uh, Topf and Sons, uh, for many years, made furnaces. Um, they subsequently transformed much of what they did to produce crematoria. They were one of the two companies that produced essentially every crematorium that was used in any of the camps uh, across uh, the broader Third Reich. And we have diaries and letters of the engineers at Topf and Sons writing about how uh, they were so proud today because they came up with a way to make a more efficient crematorium. And they couldn't wait to go to the camp and make sure to install it. And I think what we see there in those cases is a kind of perversion of the way that many people think about the professions, not just whether it's business or law. There's a, one description that's often given of the professions that they are doing good by doing well. That you do good for society if you're a professional by being skilled at what you do. That the, the way that a doctor contributes to the health of a society is by being a skilled doctor. And the way that a civil engineer can contribute to the success of a society is by being a skilled civil engineer, by being good at making bridges that don't fall down. Uh, as somebody who recently moved from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that is a thing that is not easy to do. <laughs> and what we see is that that way of thinking enables the professional to divorce themselves from the goal. Right? I don't have to think about what it is that I'm doing, what I'm doing, what it's for. I just have to think about, did I do a good job building that bridge? I don't have to think about what's going to go over it. I just have to think about what is the efficiency of this furnace that I've created, not what's going to fuel it. Or even more generally, we see throughout the Third Reich a focus on optimization. Uh, essentially what we would today call logistics. Um, it, it is a horrible thing to say it this way, but the Nazi regime was exceptional at logistics. They designed the rail system and platform into Birkenau to optimize throughput. They optimized the layout and structure of the architectural design of Birkenau to maximize throughput. And I use that dry language because that's the kind of language they used. They used language that enabled the dehumanization of the people who were murdered in these camps. And I also use that language because it may be familiar to many of you in this room. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn here and put Nate on the spot. Uh, I know after your fellowship in 2019, you went to become, please, he is a good person, he went to be a management consultant. And management consulting is all about the language of optimization and not necessarily the language of what are the goals that we are optimizing for. That comes from the client. The client tells me what I optimize for. And so I'm wondering how have you, I mean, you are no longer a management consultant, but how, how did you wrestle with that? How did you engage with that? And, and perhaps how did your time with FASB perhaps shape the way you thought about that? Thank you for... Um for both the dig and then the recovery there, I appreciate that. Um, for what it's worth, I used to be a theater director, so it's not all bad. Um, but it's, we spend a lot of time at FASB preparing for those moments through thinking about, you know, what are your values? What are the things that you value? What are the guardrails that you put up? What are the questions that you're gonna ask before you agree to a project, to work with a group of people, to take on a client. Um, and so those frameworks are just, they're really important. And I think what I took to heart and still take to heart um, is the importance of closing that distance and not allowing um, yourself to compartmentalize or to be divorced from um, the actual end impact of the things that you do. The, the specific work I did in consulting was focused on what we call you know, human capital or human resources consulting, thinking about how the decisions businesses make 
um, actually impact the people that work there. Uh, and so that, to me, is a really exciting way to think about what is the end impact of business strategy, helping people in the C-suite leadership understand what decisions they make, how they impact people on you know, the factory floor or the line employees. And so I, in that role, got to be someone who um, helped close that distance, right? And so that is something that I'm grateful for FASB for, uh, for giving me those tools to do that. Um, and certainly, you know, I encountered a lot of people that had very different red lines. Like there's certain industries that some people would work with or wouldn't, um, certain clients people would work with or wouldn't. And I, I think that it was really important for me and for others, if, if you don't go into a role or if you didn't come into the company having thought about what those things were for you, what your core values were, um, how to make those decisions, if you didn't already uh, if you hadn't already done that work up front, it was it was probably too late. And so that's something that I've taken um, with me is just to kind of make sure that as I'm entering these situations, uh, I've done some of that you know upfront thinking and and can kind of hold fast, raise my voice um, when those moments come up. So I don't know. That, that's a little bit. I think in a <laughs> in a minute, I think we should open it up and, and ask and get some questions. But one more for you before we do that, which is you know I. I'm curious about the role you play in university classrooms, right? So I'm a little further removed from that, uh, you know, out of school, through grad school, now in the professional world, went to FASB, think about these kind of ethical issues, ethical frameworks a lot. Like, what's the conversation like um, among the people you teach? Like, is this, is this something that happens in undergraduate classrooms? Like, what's, what's the future hold? Uh, <laughs> Um, so, so I, here I can primarily speak about the kinds of things I do, which are, um, as you might have guessed from the, the, my title, uh, data science, AI, technology, computational technologies. And um, it's been really striking to watch the change over the last five years. Uh, five, seven years ago, uh, students predominantly thought of those as mathematics and programming. It's how do I manipulate numbers? And uh, as anyone um, who has picked up a newspaper in the last two to three years would know, uh, those number manipulations have ruined lives. People have been kept in jail longer than they ought to have. Uh, people have been denied loans. Um, people have been kept out of colleges. Uh, and that's just the allocation of resources, um, let alone all of the other kinds of technological failures that we've had. And what's happened in the last five to seven years is that there's been, I think, um, a, a, an awakening on the part of many students that um, you can't just do good by doing well if doing well is just the manipulation of numbers. Um, in technology, I think there's now a recognition pretty widely amongst uh, the certainly the undergraduates that I get to teach here at uh, UCSD um, that doing well has to also involve asking the question, is this good? Um, you, you can't just manipulate the numbers. You have to ask, what is it being used for? Is this something we ought to be using technology for? Uh, should we uh, optimize for clicks? Should we optimize for page views uh, to think about some of the challenges that social media and social networking have wrought over the last uh, decade because they were optimized for not the things that most of us wanted them to optimize for. Uh, and, and so I think there's now an awareness uh, that you can't just you know, work with numbers and say, well, that's someone else's job. Um, and, and I think that just as we saw uh, post-World War II with um, the Nuremberg Code in medicine, which was a direct response to the revelations in the Nuremberg trials about the, the horrific experiments of the Nazi doctors, the Nuremberg Code changed the way that medical professionals thought about their ethical obligations. And I think we're at a, we're at a moment like that right now with technology, and it's being driven by uh, folks who are, are half or less my age. Uh, and and that just, uh, that's really invigorating. But I, I think we wanted to open the floor. We have time for some questions. Um, both of us have have studied and worked on many of these issues, and we'd, we'd welcome your questions, or thoughts, or responses.
Yeah, no, so the, the question was, um, uh, how do you get people who are perhaps 19? Uh, I have a 19-year-old daughter, so I, I empathize. Um, and, and get them to understand that, um, you know, whether it's the, the famous Hannah Arendt phrase, the banality of evil, the recognition that this play, I think, forces people to engage with, and that FASB is very focused on, which is engagement with the perspective of the perpetrators, which is remarkably hard to do. Uh, it is emotionally challenging um, to stand on the platform in Birkenau, um, where I was about two months ago now, uh, to stand there and imagine yourself not as somebody getting off the train, but as one of the people watching them getting off the train. And that switch in perspective is, is I think, incredibly hard to do. Um, I, I find the, the key to getting people to start to make that switch is, and this is difficult because people resist it, but is to humanize those who perpetrated these horrific acts. Or who today, you know, when we read about, um, you know, uh, the, the Google Voice Assistant is uh, much more accurate with people with lower pitched voices such as me than people with higher pitched voices such as my wife. When we read that, to recognize that the people who built the system, they didn't set out to build a sexist system. They didn't want people to get hurt. Um, I, please don't hold this against me. I, I have friends who work at Facebook. <laughs> None of them want to destroy democracy. And there are many of them horrified by it. Um, and so getting people to, to just stop and think, it's not that the people who did these things were evil in the way that we want to think about it. We want them to be these just awful evil sociopaths, and we have a lot of evidence that many of them were. I don't want to discount that at all. But we also know that many are closer to us than we want to admit. And there are people who don't, I think, want to embrace that. Um, I was, I uh, had been, have been to camps many times, um, and I vividly remember being 20 and being in Auschwitz and that was the moment I had my, am I so sure I would not have been a part of this? Am I so sure that I wouldn't have been complicit in this? Um, and I was in a bad place for about 48 hours after. It really bothered me and it took me a long time to, to deal with it. So I don't want to minimize how hard it is. Um, but I think it's also critical uh, to, to not, not only think about uh, those who are murdered, even though, of course, they should have the most prominent place. I'll let you MC this. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, thinking of you know, the premise of what we heard at the beginning here, that the professionals, in some way, allowed this to happen. They all were complicit, but who would speak up? This, this continues today. And it went back to years and years ago. I mean, some of the research I've done and things I write, I keep thinking of that Sir Edmund Burke, who said something to the effect all it takes for evil to happen is for good men to do nothing, to say nothing. And we still have that going on. And we need more people to participate in the kinds of things that this changed. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the challenge of um, passivity is not resistance. I mean, it can be, but in many cases it's not. Being silent allows atrocities to continue. Um, I mean, I think one response is to look to the, the proverbial great people who do stand up. Um, I think there's also value in solidarity. Um, I mentioned earlier the Nuremberg Codes, and I think that those were actually tremendously important in the medical profession, precisely because they said, this is who we are. This is what we will not do. And um, social peer pressure is one of the best ways to get people to act in various ways, and that was used by the Nazis to horrific ends. Uh, the, the sense of belonging that was referenced in the play, the, the importance of getting to be part of the group the in-group, um, but if the in-group says, of course we aren't going to do those things, then all of a sudden it flips. 
And, and I think one of the things that is incumbent upon the professions, and some professions are better at this than others, uh, I will say my own part-time profession of technologists are very bad at this right now, um, is having the social norms and understandings within the profession of this is not who we are. Um, and I think that that's, uh, I think one of the lessons is the importance of those being in place. Um, it, it doesn't eliminate the need for people to stand up when they see, uh, when they see these kinds of horrific acts, or when you even start to see the slide towards the horrific act. Um, but it is a way to make it easier for people. Thanks, David. Uh, another question. Yeah, there. I lived in Germany in 55 and 56. What well, husband was in the army for political German families. And the doctor who opened the building complained early on about what Nazi Germany was doing. And so they took his son and threw him into the army and sent him to the front. And his sister, who was our landlady, told stories of standing outside her Jewish friend's house and watching the Nazis throw firebombs into the house. And yes, these are people who tried, they were upper class people who tried and felt helpless. But at the same time, they were proud, you know, in some ways. And when we were there in 56, there were still in Darmstadt bombed out buildings that said you Jew written across them. And it was a very interesting, but the business of them thinking all one way. We, we, everything had to be a specialist, a specialist. And when our club got stumped, the landlord said, I will get the specialist. Well, he spent, by the way, nine years in a Russian prison camp. I will get the specialist. And after two days, the specialist didn't come. So my husband got a plunger and went, and he said, Bonnie, God, are you a specialist? Because and when we needed a little electrical work, they sent us a 13-year-old apprentice who took an hour and a half to actually just change the plug. Because that's all they knew. And we thought, that's different from Yankee ingenuity. And in some ways, that's what helped the Nazi business, because they just knew what they had to do. Yeah, I'll, I'll simply, I completely agree that the, uh, in philosophy, in moral philosophy, there's a thing we refer to, refer to as the problem of many hands, which is when many, many people are involved in a, at the end, there's some horrible outcome, but many, many people played just an, a tiny little role uh, it was alluded to in the um, in the play about you know one person signs for the Zyklon B one person, um, and and in fact to the point that um, they you know the people who the the doctors they were, had to be doctors who would drop the Zyklon B into the gas chambers, um, they were that was their only engagement. They were not present when the prisoners were brought into the chamber. They were not present when the prisoners were brought out. So they could they could mentally distance themselves. Um, I'll just mention, you know, some of you may remember Enron, uh, which was a catastrophic failure of business accounting um, uh, with a whole lot of deception that occurred here in the United States. And that was another classic case of the problem of many hands. There were so many people and each one just did their little piece of it. And so we actually see this in, in many large organizations. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Is 
I think it is interesting to look at January 6th and to see uh, striking parallels um, to events 90 years ago. Um, and, and I will say, to, to look and think, there were people who felt that the, the burning of the Reichstag was entirely justified as a way to achieve truly noble and honorable ends. I do not agree with these people, I want to be clear. I, I'm reporting. Um, two nights ago, the, the talk back after this show uh, that Torsten Wagner did um, was about uh, Himmler's post, sort of well-known Posner speech, where he talked openly to SS officers about this hard thing we do that is nonetheless necessary for the success and purity of the German people and the glory of the fatherland. And, you know, it, it's one of the few open acknowledgments, it was secretly recorded, but um, it's one of the few open acknowledgments that they knew exactly what they were doing in the senior leadership, and they felt it was justified. And I think um, we see the, the sort of uh, astonishing ability of people to construct and, and then believe in and take in justifications that uh, their fellow citizens look and say, I, I just don't understand. Sorry, yeah, so I think we have time for one more question. I'm sorry, I keep, you, you need to jump in. <laughs> We're good. Yes, right here, last one. Um, Um, can I run out the clock? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I can't. And, and, and to, be, to be completely serious, um, I can't because I don't know how to do odds for what, what is and was a completely singular event. One of the challenges of studying and looking at the Holocaust is it, is it is not, oh, just another genocide. It is not something that we can look and say, it's only a little bit worse than these other ones. It is something that is truly singular, to the best of our knowledge, in human recorded history. The complete co-option and use of the apparatus of state force and power to systematically attempt to exterminate people because of their racial and ethnic heritage at the scale that we see in the Holocaust. The challenge that I and many who have thought about and worked on this is, how do we draw general lessons from something that is so far beyond all of the other instances we know about? Um, so you ask me, could we have massacre? What are the odds we could have massacres in the United States? That we could have systematic state-sanctioned terror? I don't want to give you those odds, but I could imagine it. But something like that, I don't know how to wrap my brain around it. And the first time I went, you may think my parents are horrible. For the first time I went to a camp, I was six years old. I've lived most of my life with a knowledge of this, and I am not Jewish. I have no family members who were in the Holocaust, and yet I've lived my life with an understanding of it, and yet I still don't understand it. So I, no, I can't give you odds, because I think we always have to remind ourselves that this isn't just one face or one name. It's, it's six million faces and names. So I'm, I just felt a need to say that at the end. <laughs>